video, we're going to be talking about something that I call the anatomy of a shapefile. I like to teach introductory GIS classes using shapefiles because it's easy to see the elements of vector data theory that we talked about during the previous videos about uh, the structure of vector data inside this particular vector data file format. So I'd like to talk about it in a little bit more detail here in this video. First of all, you should know that a shapefile is a particular file format of vector GIS data. Just like there are many different file formats for storing text, you could store it as a .txt file, a .rtf file, .doc or .docx, or even just in a .pages file format for Mac. Uh, there are multiple file formats that you can use to store vector GIS data, and the shapefile is but one of them. There are many others. But the shapefile is a very common file format to use for vector data. Originally, it was developed by Esri, and although they currently maintain its standards, and it's not quite an open format, it's not technically an open file format, they do provide lots of documentation for the shapefile, and there are lots of different software packages which can both read and write shapefiles. This makes them very handy for transferring information uh, from one system to another or one person to another. If you're trying to send someone some GIS data, some vector GIS data, but you're not sure what system they're using uh, or what software they've got, it's a pretty safe bet that they're going to be able to read the shapefile that you send them because so many GIS software packages can do that. So that's a pretty safe thing uh, to send them, and they'll be able to read your data more than likely. Uh, in fact, I've heard that the shapefile uh, has been referred to as the .doc of GIS data uh, because it is so common. So the important thing to remember about the shapefile is that it's not actually one file. That's very important. A shapefile isn't one file. We think of it as one file, one shapefile but it's actually a collection of several different files that are necessary for the GIS data to work. If you've been following along with me through this video series on introductory GIS, you'll probably remember that I started off talking uh, about GIS, and when I did that, uh, I introduced uh, the ArcGIS software package as part of the lab component of that lesson. Uh, and I started that lesson by putting a shapefile into a folder, and then I showed you the difference between looking at the shapefile with the Windows Explorer and then also Arc Catalog. So a GIS data management system is specifically designed, obviously, for GIS data. So when you're looking at a shapefile with Windows Explorer, you're using something that's not designed to understand GIS data. If you haven't tried that out on your own system and compared the two, looking at a shapefile using ArcGIS uh, Arc Catalog designed to look at those kinds of data files and then also uh, through Windows uh, Explorer, then I highly recommend that you do that so that you can see the difference between uh, a single shapefile as our catalog understands it and most GIS data would understand it and all of the collection of files as Windows Explorer understands a shapefile. Because what you're going to find out is that if you put that single shapefile into that file folder and then you look at the shapefile in both, you're going to see that little green uh, shapefile emblem sitting in our catalog, that green icon, that's emblematic of one shapefile, one sitting there. But then when you go to Windows Explorer and you open up that same file folder, you're not going to see that one file. You're going to see lots of different files that all have the same name, the name of the shapefile, but that also have uh, uh, all different file extensions. And that's what I mean when I say the shapefile is actually multiple files. And it also emphasizes again that point about why it's so important to use GIS data management software, dedicated GIS management software, whenever you need to manage your GIS data. And you don't try to do that through Windows Explorer. Because if we try to copy the shapefile using Windows Explorer, you have to be certain to copy all of those component files of the shapefile, otherwise you're going to end up corrupting your data. If you copy and paste shapefiles in our catalog, for instance, it, the system takes care of making sure that all of the component files of the shapefile move with you and go where you want them to go. I had students who've tried to manage their GIS data through Windows Explorer, and inevitably they end up shredding all of their data. They end up corrupting all of their shapefiles. 
I once had a student who had uh, component files of his data, of his shape files, uh, on his home computer. Others were sitting on his, the lab computer. I think others were on his office computer. And there were others that were on his thumb drive. And he couldn't figure out why his data wasn't working anymore. He had to start over because we couldn't find all of the parts of those shapefiles to reassemble them. You can reassemble a shapefile by putting all of their component parts back inside a single file folder, uh, but that's only if you can find them all. So here in this video, I want to take a look in detail at what each one of those component files are of the shapefile so that you really understand uh, the file structure of the shapefile, the anatomy of the shapefile as I call it. So basically, there are three core files that you have to have at a minimum to make up a shapefile. If you don't have these three files, then you don't have a shapefile at all. Okay, It's not going to function for you. So I'm going to give you the file extensions for these component files and uh, tell you exactly what they do. Each of these files, these individual component files, would be named exactly the same, or named with the exact same name as the shapefile as, as a whole. Uh, it's just that they're going to have different file extensions. So what you have, uh, if you have a shapefile named uh, cities, for example, uh, would be several component files to that shapefile that are all named cities, but that have different file extensions. Those go together to make up your shapefile. So the first of these component files that we want to talk about is the .shp file. The .shp file stores all of the feature geometry. Of course, as we've been saying, the geometry is an extremely important part of the vector data model. So all of the information about the geometry that we have to have is going to be stored inside of this .shp file. Where all of the points are, where all of the vertexes are of the polylines, where all of the vertexes are of the polygons, uh, in what order they're connected, all of that information that will allow the computer to make up the geometry is going to be stored in this .shp uh, file. The second core file is the .dbf file. The .dbf file is a database file format for simple, and some people would call a flat, a database. Now we're not talking about complicated relational database structures here. We're talking about a very simple uh, database structure uh, that's a single table uh, that is used to create the attribute table of the shapefiles. So it's a very simple file format uh, that's used to store that data table of all of the aspatial information. And if you don't believe me that it stores your attribute information, you can actually open up the .dbf file in some spreadsheet programs, such as some versions of Microsoft Excel and uh, I think some versions of OpenOffice as well. If you do that, then you'll see the shapefiles attribute table displayed as a spreadsheet. Okay, now in general, I don't recommend that you do this. You can try it out for experimentation purposes and, and see what you see, and you'll confirm that it's there. But in general, I don't recommend working with spreadsheets in, or excuse me, working with the attribute table in a spreadsheet format like that. Uh, because it seems that it's very, very easy to corrupt your .dbf files. And if you do that, uh, then your whole shapefile is corrupted and it's not going to be able to be read with a GIS software. But technically, it is possible to work with attribute table information as a standalone .dbf file in some other file format uh, that is capable of, uh, of manipulating it. Uh, I, I have noticed in a couple of situations uh, where even if you can open a .dbf as a spreadsheet, some spreadsheet programs, like I think some versions of Microsoft Excel, can't save back out as a .dbf. So you can open it up, you can then convert it into a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet, uh, but if you do that, uh, then you're not ever going to be able to get it back into a .dbf file, which is what the shape file requires in order to work. So you can experiment with it. Please do check it out, uh, but beware of corrupting your data if you are, uh, are looking at a shape file, particularly an important one, uh, in that way. So the third core file is the .shx file. The, uh, the .shx file is an index file that assists in making the connection uh, between the geometry uh, and the attribute table. Uh, for our purposes here, you can think of the .shx file as being that link between the geometry and the attribute table. That was another important component uh, of the vector data format. Although, 
uh, if you're actually going to get into the file structure of the shapefile, uh, much harder core than we're doing here, especially for programmatic purposes, uh, which we're not going to be doing in uh, this video series either. Uh, the index file, that .shx file, uh, technically helps make that link between the two, uh, the geometry and the attribute table, uh, speedier and more efficient. Uh, but nonetheless, in a general sense, uh, you can see that when we talked about the vector data theory uh, in generalities and the theory of storing data in the vector data format, uh, when we talked about geometry, when we talked about attribute tables, and we talked about that link between the two, that you can directly see all of that theory right here in the shapefile structure uh, uh, very, very directly. Uh, and if you have these three files, then technically you have a shapefile. That's what's needed in order to make a shapefile uh, operate. If you're missing one or more of these files, maybe you've accidentally copied it someplace else or uh, pasted it someplace else or deleted it, if you've done that, uh, then you don't have a shapefile. You're not going to be able to add it to any of your GIS software and you're not going to be able to manipulate it uh, the way that you uh, want to do. So if you want to practice with that on your own, you can practice deleting one of these files or, uh, from Windows Explorer and then seeing what happens to your shapefile when you try to add it to a GIS project. Uh, but it's not going to work for you. All of these files have to be in the same folder and they also have to have the same name. So if you're working with a shapefile of uh, cities, uh, in the United States and you have uh, the shapefile's name is cities, then you're going to have cities.shp, cities.dbf, and cities.shx. You can also experiment with what happens if you rename one of these files like say city rather than cities uh, and what's going to happen is that the system is not going to be able to combine those files into one operational shapefile because the system uses the name that each one of those component files has in order to determine what shapefile in that file folder it goes to in order to create them when you look at them in GIS. Uh, so again, if you're working in our catalog or other GIS software designed to manage GIS data, if you were to do something like rename a shapefile, it will automatically rename all of the component files for you. So, although we just talked about these three core files that are essential to have a shapefile at all, I hope that you have at least two more files uh, that uh, you have to have in order to have what I consider a complete shapefile. So you got to have three in order to have a shapefile at all, three to have a functioning shapefile, but I think two more in order to have what I would consider a complete shapefile uh, for your GIS data. And one of these other files that you have to have is called uh, the .prj file, extension .prj. And the .prj file stores all of the coordinate system information for the shapefile. And you might think that this kind of information uh, would be stored within the geometry file itself, okay, but it's not. Okay, the geometry file, the .shp, stores all of the coordinate system information that specifies all of the vertexes necessary to construct your point, you know, your line, your area, or your multi-patch geometry uh, in terms of, for example, latitude and longitude. Uh, but we know from a previous study that it matters what assumptions you make about the size and shape of the Earth whenever you designate coordinates for the vertexes of some geometry. So if you make different assumptions about the size and shape of the Earth, then you may very well have different coordinates for the same place on the planet. And we want to make sure that all of our GIS data lines up when we add it to all of our projects. We expect this to happen, right? We expect that when we add the United States, for instance, uh, to a GIS project, we have add all of the states, okay? And then if we go and add another data file that has all of the counties, and then we add another data file that adds all of the rivers, we expect for them to overlay in their proper positions relative to one another. So in order to get this to happen, the system not only needs to know uh, all of the coordinates that go together to create all of the vertexes of the geometry, either the points, the vertexes, the lines, and so forth, but the system also needs to know uh, what set of assumptions were used about the size and shape of the Earth uh, in order to get those coordinates for each, in particular, uh, each particular vertex. So it's definitely possible for different shapefiles to use different sets of assumptions, different assumptions about the size and shape of the planet. On the whole, that's perfectly okay. We could certainly use one set of assumptions to collect all of the coordinates of 
uh, for example, all of the states of the United States, and then we could use a different set of assumptions to collect all the data about uh, the river systems. Now, I will note here that we do want to use the exact same assumptions for all of the data within a single shapefile. That's best practice. We don't want to change up our assumptions uh, within uh, the same shapefile, and we'll talk more about that later. But it's very frequently the case that we do use different sets of assumptions uh, with, with between different shapefiles, for different shapefiles, and that's okay. The computer will be able to handle that and will still be able to properly align all of the data so long as the information about which set of assumptions were used is communicated to the computer system. All of that information about those assumptions is held in the .prj file. So if you don't have that file, the computer won't know what coordinates to place uh, where for all of the geometry. It's, it's got these coordinates, but it won't know the assumptions that were made about the size and shape of the Earth in order to get that data to align with other data files, which may well be using different assumptions. That's fine, but in order to get them to align correctly, the computer has to make its adjustments, and so it has to know. Uh, which set of assumptions were used. Therefore, that's why I say that in order to have a complete shapefile, okay, you need to have a .prj file with your shapefile. Uh, by the way, it seems like I used to have a lot more trouble with shapefiles not having their .prj files than I do today. When I was an undergraduate and we were still working with a lot of uh, U.S. Census data that wasn't really designed to be GIS data, uh, but had been pressed into use for GIS anyway, uh, it seems like it was very common for those files to not have .prj files uh, because they weren't designed as GIS data in the beginning. So that caused a lot of problems, especially as further data sets were created based on those files and so that their legacy files inside other data sets. Uh, they wouldn't have the .prj file either, and, and this created a lot of problems. But fortunately, when I'm downloading data today, I don't typically find that I have that problem quite as much. So that's really good. But still, as a general note, uh, when I was in a situation when I didn't have a .prj file with one of my shape files, I used to think uh, that in the event that was the case, I could figure out what set of assumptions that data file was using if I looked really, really hard at the geometry. You know, maybe there was some way that I could figure out what coordinate system had been used if I very closely examined the data file. This is not true. If you don't know the coordinate system that was used to collect the data, then there's really no way to make that determination just by examining the data. And if you think about it, if I broke that shapefile's geometry, all of those vertexes, down into a table that just had the latitude and longitude of all the vertexes in the file, and then I ask you to determine what assumptions were made about the shape and size of the planet when those measurements were taken, uh, it wouldn't be possible. You wouldn't be able to give me that information. Therefore, for the same reason, if you don't have, a, if you, or if you do have a shape file, but you don't have that .prj file, then the only thing that you can do in order to determine uh, what coordinate system is being used uh, is to try to talk to the people who created the file and get them to tell you what coordinate system was used. Or maybe you can find, I hope you can find this information in the metadata or in other reference material that describes the data set. And if you don't have that, then you're out of luck. Uh, if you can find that information, or you can get the people who created the data set to tell you uh, what set of assumptions was used, uh, then you can add a .prj file to a shape file uh, if it doesn't have one. Uh, if you know, you can go and specify it and create it. Okay, so the fifth file that you need to have in order to have what I consider a complete shape file uh, is a .shp .xml. Okay, so .shp.xml. And this file stores all of the metadata about the shape file. And metadata is data about data. And it's absolutely essential to a data set in order to have metadata created. We're going to talk uh, more about metadata in general in a future video, but this is the file that will tell you, or should tell you, all of the very important information about that file, such as who created the data set. Okay, when was it created? When was the last time that it was updated? What methodology was used to create the data? What do all of the field names in the attribute table mean? Sometimes those are rather, crypt uh, rather cryptic. You want to know what they all mean. Uh, who's responsible for further updates to the data set? When can I expect another update to this data set? Uh, what scale was used when the data set was created? Uh, what uh, scale uh, is appropriate to use this data set for? Etc., 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 etc. 
All of this is extremely important information that you want to know about your data sets, uh, regardless of what project you're going to be using it in, uh, but especially if you're going to be using it in any kind of scientific analysis. And it always seems like that uh, if you don't have this information, that's when you really uh, start to miss it, uh, when you realize that, oh, I really do need to know what scale this data set is appropriate for, or I really do need to know when, is this, uh, when was this last updated? When is it going to be updated again? And all of a sudden, if you don't know that information, it can sometimes make it extremely difficult and, well, and often make it very difficult, sometimes make it just flat out impossible to uh, complete your, uh, your project, uh, especially with any kind of integrity. So having your metadata is extremely important. Uh, and therefore, conveniently, the shapefile format has this way of storing all the metadata in the XML data format uh, as a component file uh, for the shapefile. And this means that once uh, you create a metadata file for some data set that you've created, uh, or at least a shape file that you've created, uh, and then you use GIS data management software to manage that, which you should do if you copy and paste uh, and transfer your GIS information in some way, uh, again, as you should be doing, then all of the metadata is going to go with that file because the shape file, the GIS uh, software package, will transfer it all as one file, even though it's multiple files. So if you send your shape file to somebody else, you've got the metadata already written into it, uh, then they will have access to that metadata as well, and you don't even have to think about uh, transferring the metadata separately from the data itself or it getting lost. This is uh, very convenient, that the metadata is just capable of being part of the shape file itself. So the metadata for a shapefile is stored in an XML file, and XML stands for the Extensible Markup Language. This is a core web technology and a web standard, and you can learn a lot about XML and its file format online. For the purposes of this course, though, we're not really going to get into the specifics of XML. Uh, however, since it is a core web technology and it's used to store metadata and shapefiles, I highly recommend that anyone who's interested in GIS beyond uh, an introductory level become familiar with the XML technical uh, specifications uh, and how to use it, uh, especially if you end up being interested in doing GIS development for the web or for mobile devices. Uh, being familiar with XML to be able to store and transfer uh, data is extremely important. It, it's a very, very handy thing to know. So I highly recommend uh, your uh, learning uh, at least a little bit about XML if you're interested in GIS uh, beyond anything than the, the very basics. Uh, okay, so I think that pretty much wraps up what I wanted to say uh, regarding the anatomy of a shapefile. There are some other component files to the shapefile that you will sometimes have. Uh, oftentimes these are automatically generated by software packages when you try to execute uh, certain tasks in order to make other tasks more efficient or that task more efficient uh, or able to be executed faster. Uh, we can address all of those uh, other component files in a more advanced class, or if we're working uh, programmatically with shapefiles, uh, they may become important. Uh, but the files that I have articulated here, the .shp, the .dbf, uh, the .shx, the .prj, and then the XML file, the .shp.xml file, uh, are the five core uh, that I think people should be familiar with for the purposes of this class. I think they're the essential files uh, that anyone, even at an introductory level, in GIS needs to be familiar with, and that's why we went over them uh, in this video here. So I hope that you have a much greater understanding now of exactly uh, what the shapefile format is and understand exactly how the data is stored in it and how that relates to vector data theory. Uh, and then I will uh, see you in the next video when we move on.